Now we're going to take the situation we were looking at on paper where we were pumping water up a hill and we're going to try it in a Jupyter notebook with some Python code so that it'll uh, run repeatedly and we can change our calculations and get some fairly instant answers. But let's follow through what we're doing here. In this cell up at the top here, we've got a markdown cell and we've got a major heading pumping water up a hill and some information that we can uh, we can format so that tells us what to do. And one of the things it tells us is that this notebook uses the Python fluids library. And if we want to install it, we'll have to run this command in a terminal window. So let me format that. I'll run that cell and it formats to be a little bit more readable. Now I need to go and find out where that terminal window went. There's a terminal window, so if I type pip install fluids, that's the Python install program, and I run it, it says that the requirement's already satisfied because I already installed it on my Anaconda. But if you did the same thing, it would go out and find it and install it on your Anaconda uh, installation, and you'd have the functions that you needed in order to do this, uh, this setup. So let's go back here. We've got the fluids library installed. Now I'm going to run this cell. It's going to import a bunch of stuff about piping and friction factors from the fluids library, as well as some of the other libraries that we're used to importing. So I'll run that one. Nothing really happened. It didn't show any output, but uh, we weren't expecting any output. That was just getting things set up. This markdown window tells us what we're about to do, which is set up some of the values. And here's the paper version of the layout that, uh, that we talked about before. So we've got a pump that's pumping water out of a reservoir, maybe Lake Ontario. Uh, through some piping and some valves up to a tank, maybe a water tower, that's about 40 meters above lake level. Also about 40 meters above street level, because today we're going to presume that Kingston's completely flat at the level of the lake. And it supplies some flow to an application. In this case, it's 0.1 cubic meters per second which is enough to allow 750 people to take a shower at one time. So let's go and do some calculations with this. In this cell, I'm just setting the height of the tank at 40 meters, the length of the piping 120 meters. So we're only dealing with an area right down by the lake, a small zone where we're going to run our own water system. I've set the piping to be 6 inches because that was the nominal diameter that I picked uh, when we were first uh, trying this example. And I'm choosing Schedule 40 pipe. Pipe comes in a variety of different schedules or, or uh, weights of pipe. Schedule 40 is a fairly typical pipe for low pressure applications in carbon steel. It's widely available and provides enough to uh, satisfy moderate pressures and still leave a reasonable allowance for corrosion so that you'll have a good long life from the pipe. The value I got before for the sum of the K factors for everything that was here, so the gate valve, the globe valve, uh, the other gate valve, the exit, the entrance, and so on, I wound up with a sum of the K factors equal to 15 and a roughness of about 0.05 millimeters. So I'm going to have to keep track of the fact that that's in millimeters. My design flow rate I want is 0.1 cubic meters per second. And the kinematic viscosity of water is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, meters squared per second. Density about 998 kilograms per cubic meter. And of course gravity is 9.81. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to follow the paper process that we did before. Well, better make sure I run that cell and assign all of those things their, their values. And I'll format this cell. <clears throat> and I'm going to use this function called nearest pipe to figure out what the actual inside diameter of a 6-inch Schedule 40 pipe is in meters. So nearest pipe, you give it some diameter information, schedule information. And the second thing that it returns, it returns multiple different values. But the second thing that it returns... So this one with the uh, 1 as an index 
because the indices go 0, 1, 2, and so on, allows me to get the inside diameter. And you can play with this nearest pipe function a little bit. So I'm going to define another function called id, which takes the nominal pipe size and uh, could take a schedule setting or an inside diameter setting or whatever, but uh, it'll start by assuming that we've got no specified diameters. And it'll return what the uh, inside diameter is. So let's try this out. I'm going to define that function. And now I'm going to set d equal to the id of our nominal diameter, 6, with a schedule of, quote, 40, quote, and see what comes out. And when I run it, I get 0 0.1541, or 0 0.15408, which is really 0 0.1541 to four decimal places. And that's what I got on paper before when I went and looked up the uh, size of a Schedule 40 pipe. It was 154.1 millimeters. So that's good. That's working. Let's calculate the relative roughness. And we need to make sure to include a factor of 1,000 here for converting between meters and millimeters. Because that diameter there, it's in meters. And this uh, roughness height was in millimeters. So I'll do that calculation and I get 0 0.00032, which is the same number that we got uh, previously when we did this work on paper. I can calculate the velocity as the flow divided by the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and I get a velocity of 5.36 meters per second, just like I did before. I can calculate the Reynolds number, and once again, I get 826,000. So fairly high Reynolds number. I can calculate the friction factor, and this is a function that basically does a, a Moody diagram lookup if you supply it with the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. And last time I looked it up on the Moody diagram, but this time I'm going to run this function and I get 0 0.016. So that agrees. So that's good. And finally, I'll just check and find out what the product FL over D is. And I get 12 and a half, uh, which is what I got before on paper as well. So that's good. And that's 12 and a half for friction compared to the sum of the k values up here was about 15. So about half of our losses are going to uh, the friction in the pipe, and the other half of those losses are going to so-called minor losses. So the minor losses are actually a major component of the head loss due to friction in the pipe. So the system head required must overcome the elevation, friction, and minor losses. So we're going to finally put it all together to get the system head required. We did it procedurally one step at a time, and that makes the process fairly easy. The system head requirement is going to be the head of the tank, how much we need for elevation, plus whatever we lost along the way the FL over D plus sigma K times V squared over 2G. So this is just the same equation that we had on paper. And when I run that, I get the 80.27 meters of head rise that we're going to need across our pump in order to satisfy the uh, head requirements of the system. Now we could back substitute all the work that we did up above and get a huge equation and it's this ugly equation here, which is kind of long and drawn out. It's got a whole lot of calls to this ID function. It's only got things like the nominal diameter and the schedule in it, the length and the flow rate. And if I did that, I get the same number coming out, really exactly the same number coming out, even out to many, many decimal places. So this was just packing in everything uh, that I had done in a sequence up here. Now doing things in sequence with this procedural approach lets me do things one step at a time and makes it fairly easy to see what's going on. And that's a good thing both on paper and in any computational approach. So I really don't like this approach to doing the calculation. However, I can see where it might be advantageous to be able to get things in terms of Q for our equation 
we wound up with an equation before for what the system head had to be in terms of the flow rate, and that was a good one. So I could back substitute for Q into, into velocity and get an equation that looks like this. It's got most of our simplifications in it, but it's still leaving the velocity as Q over A. And when I do the calculation that way, I get, again, the same number to a very, very close approximation. Finally, if I wanted to, I could take this stuff here that's multiplying times Q and calculate it as a separate constant and just get the system head as the head rise that we've got to have to overcome the elevation plus some other chunk that varies with the flow rate squared. And that was the equation that I found was going to be simple in order to be able to, uh, to put things up onto our pump characteristics to see where the two were going to intersect. So finally, I can do this calculation. And there's the equation that I got on paper. The system head must be equal to the elevation I need to overcome, those 40 meters, plus 4,026.69, which is basically 4,027 times Q squared. And that gives me my overall result of 80.27 meters head rise that I've got to have across the pump.